Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Deepak Nair to discuss what has been called as the external credit balance crisis India is entering into. Deepak, good to have you with us. Thank you. There is a lot of talk about India entering a danger zone with now our external balances, that the deficit, external balance deficit is going up and it can lead to, some people have said in the next three to five years into a crisis. How serious is this issue and what is this issue? The issue is serious. Uh, but in order for me to address the question about what is the issue, I need to begin with the primer. Exactly. Right? Uh, most people, the concerned citizen, the layperson, think of the external sector in terms of exports and imports that exports bring you foreign exchange earnings and imports induce you to make payments abroad. Uh, and at best, people think of the balance of trade, the difference between exports and imports. It could be a surplus, as it is in China, or it could be a massive deficit, as it is in India. Okay? Um, so, to begin at the beginning, the difference between exports and imports is the balance of trade, which could be a surplus or a deficit. Uh, in India, in the financial year that has just gone by, 2012-13, uh, our total exports were 300 billion US dollars and our total imports were about 500 billion US dollars. So that you have a balance of trade deficit that is 200 billion US dollars in terms of its rupee equivalent at current exchange rates. Now, to give you some idea about how large this is, uh, uh, our GDP or national income in 2012-13 was 2 trillion US dollars. So it is 10% of GDP. Hmm? So that's a huge deficit that is in huge. terms of the GDP. That is enormous. Now, of course, we need to recognize that there aren't, the, you know, exports and imports of goods, which is what these numbers are about, but there are also exports and imports of services. So that if you look at software exports, huh, they would be 90 uh, billion. Huh? They are large. Uh, but at the end of the day, you could still have a balance of trade on account of goods and services both. Hmm? And that is pretty close to the same number. 200 billion. Okay? Uh, now, that is because you pay for shipping, you pay for tourism, you pay for insurance, you pay for students going abroad, you pay for people getting health care abroad. Hmm? Uh, you have transnational corporations that invest in India, they repatriate dividends. All of that is what is called invisibles. So the balance of merchandise trade plus uh, the balance on invisibles really gives you the balance on current account. Hmm? But there is one component which is critical, which is large for India, but is m very small or insignificant for most countries. And that is remittances from migrants, uh, people of Indian origin who live abroad. Please note that typically remittances are large from migrants who have low incomes, who have low skills, and who are poor people before they leave India, because they need to support the consumption of their families. Typically, uh, West Asian typically remittances West are Asian. higher than, for instance, the American remittances. Much higher. Because the middle class tends to give its money largely in uh, United States if they go abroad. Yes, While or the, here in financial assets, in non resident deposits with yeah. higher rates of return and so on. West Asian people do, yeah. when the people go to West Asia, they tend to remit the money. And back also, to the as family. migration streams age, when people are there for 30 years or 50 years, their connect with the home diminishes. But remittances in India in 2012 13 were 70 billion US dollars the largest of any country in the world, all right? Much larger than foreign direct investment and portfolio investment put together for India. Now, essentially, what remittances do 
just like if you have any net earnings on invisible's account like shipping tourism investment and so on they help to finance your balance of trade deficit all right now if we take account of remittances then the current account deficit uh, in india's balance of payments uh, which is the balance of trade plus all invisibles including remittances uh, is about 200 uh, sorry is about 90 to 100 billion dollars okay which is 5% of gdp all right uh, now in the third quarter of 2012 13 uh, this current account deficit was as much as 6.7% of gdp but for the year as a whole it would be 5% of gdp all right now the current account determines your borrowing needs because you have to finance it if you are unable to finance it in terms of bridging the gap then you have to run down your foreign exchange reserves all right and as foreign exchange reserves run down there's often a crisis of confidence and a run on currency now to to understand how large the magnitude of this problem is i will make two kinds of comparisons uh, those some with other countries at this point in time and some with india in the past all right now if you look at china it has a current account surplus that is 5% of gdp uh, and it has a balance of trade surplus on a kind of merchandise trade that is about 10% to gdp so it's a mirror image of india the exact opposite uh, and if you look at countries such as germany uh, or japan which are also the classic current account surplus countries their current account surpluses are in the range of 3 to 5% of gdp all right uh, the united states has a current account deficit that is about 2 and 1/2 3% of gdp now so we are doing much worse uh, than most other developing countries brazil's current account deficit is 1% of gdp china so is amongst the emerging economies india is doing our external better. sector is far and away in the worst situation at this present moment now some people who watch this program might recall that we ran into a balance of payments crisis in the late 1980s uh, which surfaced in 1990 1991 all right now at that time our current account deficit was a little less than 3% of gdp uh, so that what you need to remember is what is the balance of trade deficit hmm? what is the difference between the balance of trade deficit and the current account deficit Hmm? and typically given our large remittances the current account deficit is much less than the trade deficit huh? but the current account deficit is the amount you have to borrow abroad hmm? uh, to meet your external finance needs just as the fiscal deficit of the government is the difference between its income and expenditure that has to be met by borrowing so you can think of it as the analog uh, this is the difference between your foreign exchange earnings and your foreign exchange payments receipts and payments that you have to meet by borrowing but if you have a current account deficit of the government you can print money if you want but in the case of an external account external deficit that's a, that's not something it's not possible the only country that can do that is the united states because they have the benefit of what is called seniorage the us dollar is international money so they can borrow through intermediation in domestic capital markets they don't have to borrow abroad but everybody else and that includes the european union and euroland many of which uh, many of which countries are in deep crisis uh, uh, with with similar uh, difficulties spain ireland portugal greece italy is not far behind uh, have exactly the same problem hmm? uh, that uh, beyond the point as your current account deficit mounts and as the fundamentals of your economy do not look too good people begin to doubt your capacity to repay what you borrow and they stop lending to you 
So the confidence, if it decreases in the market, would mean then your borrowing costs would go up or it would stop borrowing. Absolutely. What things happen? First, costs go up. And second, the finance dries up. Hmm? Now, this has happened time and again as countries have run into financial crises. It happened to us in 1990-91 as there was a run on the NRI deposits. That's, that's the time that you were really trying to arrange for loans, if I remember correctly, <laughs> and <laughs> negotiating with the IMF and so on. But at that time, the quantum still was very small compared to what it is today. A borrowings of 2 to $4 billion from the IMF was a significant amount, but you're talking about now yeah. something like 50, 60 billion dollars. Now that's a much but larger deficit. Probably you need to remember that was more than 20 years ago. Uh, so there is inflation, there is exchange rate depreciation, uh, but in, in real terms, uh, it was not that much smaller, uh, but significantly smaller. It was 3% of GDP. The balance of trade deficit was 5% of GDP. It's now roughly double that. That's what matters. It's relative size to uh, yeah, to the GDP. Really, you need to normalize it because billions of dollars change as prices change, as exchange rates change. But uh, that, you know, that was one of the ironies of my life. I wrote about it through the late 80s saying that there's going to be a macroeconomic crisis and the crunch will come and there will be a run on the rupee. Now, I was in the middle of it, managing the crisis when it came. Now, so we have in the external sector the seeds of a macroeconomic crisis. All right? Now, these crises are not like time bombs that they will explode at a given moment, I can predict to you or to your viewers. They're a bit like treadmills, all right? Uh, so that uh, you have large current account deficits, they're associated with a, a, a stifling of investment, a slowing down of growth rates, an erosion of confidence, and uh, a sense in international capital markets that all is not well, or that it all is not what it should be. Now that's what credit rating agencies such as Moody's and Standard & Poor do the world over. Uh, they provide credit ratings to sovereign debt, hmm, essentially in the interest of protecting their investors. Uh, is it a reliable place to lend to, to buy bonds off? And that's why you have a finance minister who is deeply worried about what the credit rating agencies might do. Because please, please remember, let me just finish this last bit, that if we have a, a, a current account deficit of $100 billion, it has to be financed somehow. Huh? Now, we are not running down our reserves. They're roughly at 300 billion. They could run down very fast. In Brazil, in Russia, $100 billion worth of reserves have been lost in five days when there's a run on the currency in a financial crisis. So essentially, what we are doing is that we are financing this current account deficit either by short-term borrowing or by medium-term borrowing in capital markets or with a mix of foreign direct investment and portfolio investment. All right. Now, in 2012-13, uh, broad orders of magnitude, foreign direct investment was about $30 billion, and portfolio investment was about $30 billion. So the rest would have had to come about $30 billion from other forms of borrowing, short-term, medium-term, long-term, from the government, by the private sector, by public sector firms, and a whole range. That's how we are financing it. The moment we are not able to finance it, we will have to run down reserves to bridge that gap. Hmm? Now, what you need to recognize is that some of this borrowing is short term, six months. Huh? And in 1991, by the way, we were borrowing $2 billion overnight in international capital markets, every night, rolling over that debt. Hmm? Uh, the numbers are now much larger. So there's a short term debt. And there are liabilities that can be withdrawn on demand, such as portfolio investment. Hot so, money. As hot money. Called. So that if, if Moody's or Standard & Poor uh, downgrade us, we are on watch, we are downgraded to junk status, then pension funds and mutual funds are mandated by their shareholders and boards to pull the money out. This doesn't matter if they pull it out at a loss because prices will plummet in stock markets. Uh, so in a situation where you have such a large current account deficit, 
uh, which is being financed either by borrowing, and people can begin to doubt your capacity to repay the debt, or by short-term liabilities that can be withdrawn on demand, and the two together are much larger than our foreign exchange reserves, uh, you could have a drawdown at a pace you would not believe. And that's when you get a run on currencies. It's happened in Brazil, in Turkey, in Russia, in Thailand, in Korea, everywhere over the past 15 years for countries that are integrated into international financial markets. So the answer, in my view, does not lie in the finance minister going out on roadshows, uh, persuading people that we are in the Republic of India mean to address our problems, have confidence in us. This is really postponing the day of reckoning. We need to begin to address the fundamentals that the balance of trade deficit must come down from this level of 10% of GDP. The balance of the current account deficit must come down from 5% of GDP. It must come down uh, in proportionate terms, so at least half of what it is at present. Now, what you then have to do is you have to actually address in real terms what's happening to your exports and imports. This is my really my next question, that effectively then what we need to look at is how to reduce the import content of what we are, what we are taking. You see, at the moment the industry seems to be very import intensive. A lot of our, uh, for instance, take automobile manufacture, the amount of petroleum that we then have to burn, and so on. So if you have a kind of trajectory of growth, which is highly import intensive, then your imports increase. And correspondingly, we have not stressed on the manufacturing sector, which needs good infrastructure primarily. And we are focusing really on services as export. Do you think this trajectory itself is, is in some sense flawed? It is and it is not. I would focus on exports of services because we have a comparative advantage in software and in other labor intensive services. And were it not for software exports or remittances that come from our migrants, uh, we would be in much deeper trouble. So I would pay every possible attention to, to supporting software exports. And we are do doing many things to disturb that confidence uh, uh, in terms of tax policy and so on. And I would do everything to ensure that remittances from migrants continue to come through legal channels rather than illicit channels as they used to. Having said that, I think we need to worry about uh, imports. Hmm? You know, if you look at our import bill, $500 billion last year, $170 billion is crude oil and petroleum products. Almost $60 billion is gold. Hmm? Uh, now, some people think it's desirable. I think it's neither necessary nor desirable. It is something we can do without. Uh, consumer electronics imports are about $35 billion. Coal imports, because we don't mine our own coal enough. We're not able to get the coal out of the ground. $25 billion. Uh -huh. So we could address uh, petroleum. We are net importers. There are exports. There is exploration. And that is something that's going to be needed. We may worry about the use of fossil fuels in the long term, about what it will do to the environment. Or we may worry why are we bringing in so much petroleum for everybody to run their two-wheeler, three-wheeler, four-wheeler on our roads. It's a question of public transport. We need to do, develop right. public transports, yes. You can see metro taking place in Delhi has reduced of a lot of the car By use. Way, individuals are rational beings. Who would want to drive two and a half hours to work every day and back if they would take a metro? Exactly. Yeah. So that's even in the short run, if we can't do anything about petroleum, we can address both gold and coal. And we need also to begin to rethink our import intensive pattern of industrialization a little. But you know, we shouldn't think of imports in a negative mode anyway. If you look at China, the average import content of its exports is 50 percent. Uh, the, the, the Mac, uh, the iPhone, the iPad that are assembled in China, its import content is on average 95 percent. The point is they are creating employment, uh, which yields wages to workers, and they are earning foreign exchange in some sectors more than in others. Our problem is that our import liberalization 
has been in general a consumption liberalization or a liberalization that brings in imports for domestic manufacturing for domestic markets. But we tend to continue to be tight on exporters. You look at clothing, our exports are less than 10 billion. Bangladesh is close to 20 billion. Vietnam is 12 billion. Even three years ago, these countries were way behind. You know, I won't even mention China's exports of garments. But the average import entitlement for our garment exporters is 3%. Huh? In China, it's 40%. You have no, there's no hindrance. So in a sense, we could use import liberalization to drive our national interests if the export sector was given preferential access. This is what all the East Asian countries did. Korea, Taiwan, before them Japan, after them China, all of them. Uh, import liberalization for export promotion somehow We've got that balance completely wrong. Now, uh, therefore, the moral of my story is, A, that the current account deficit is at levels which are unsustainable. Uh, that beyond a point, we are not going to be able to finance this because confidence will progressively be undermined. And in that sense, a macroeconomic crisis is impending. Uh, when it happens, I That's cannot difficult. predict, but any spark could ignite that process. It could be an election outcome that produces an unstable government. Uh, uh, it could be inflation rising again. Uh, it could be any number of things. It could be the oil price of oil rising again. Fortunately, oil prices are also soft. So we have to begin to address fundamentals in the external sector. And that is, as I said, given our bonanza of remittances and given some amount of foreign direct investment, which is at least not volatile capital flows or not hot money, whatever its other pros and cons may be. Other than that, all borrowing is not sustainable in the long run uh, because you have to earn rates of return higher than the rate of interest plus the exchange of depreciation that takes place in the interim. So. I think we have to address on a priority basis what are we going to support the export sector in the Indian economy. Mm -hmm. And that is the subject of neglect. And some would argue if you talk to people engaged in exports, there's not benign neglect. The garment exporters, they're, they're, they're large. The engineering goods exporters, the chemicals exporters, uh, we have killed the auto parts exports by entering into a free trade agreement with ASEAN as everybody has moved lock, stock and barrel to Thailand. And there are many concerns we might have about a free trade uh, arrangement with the European Union. But that's another issue. I won't go into it. Uh, suffice it to say that the situation we are in in the external sector is unsustainable. That we might postpone the day of reckoning by financing from here and from there and by creating a sense of confidence. But at the end of the day, we have to address the fundamentals. And I don't see any evidence that the problem is being addressed. Uh, even with gold, some amount of quantitative restrictions, some modest tariffs, 15%, uh, would curb demand. Uh, and, uh, you know, the specter of smuggling is always made larger than life. But even smugglers have transaction costs. And if you have good monitoring systems, you did in the old days, uh, it's possible. I mean, it's not uh, given. Um, so my answer is uh, the problem of the external sector is serious. Uh, that financing it in the short term is no solution. We have no choice. We have to find the finance. Or we need to address the fundamentals but, and the real sectors of the economy. And at the moment, we are more interested in dressing our, ourselves up through roadshows, as you said, with the finance minister to keep up yeah. the short-term confidence. But we are not at the simultaneously looking at the yeah. long-term trajectory, which yeah. is really the crux of the issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhu.